I'd like to thank Margo and Karen and Judy and all the other people, Gunter, for inviting me. And it's a great pleasure to be here. I have never been speaking to an audience with so many women, so it's wonderful. And so here I will report on our project, which has been going on for two or three years uh, with a bunch of uh, collaborators and co-lead uh, Urban Fry, a biology from uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. I just want to advocate for our call now a holistic approach to data science, which is not just one particular uh, like domain, but it's really everything integrated. So a lot of things I speak, I think, can be mapped to uh, the business world, like the domain science, like I work on remote sensing, neuroscience, genomics, and also embedding there is the personal skill to pull everything together, and that's kind of related to the art part. And also you need the more hard muscle type of analysis, analytical, but also the view on theoretical statistics now I take is really you have multiple idealized model to analyze something already proven practice uh, empirically. And then you definitely have the technology software to support. So uh, domain knowledge in business like the what in the last talk, like a merchandise. And in terms of art uh, of the CSI, I recently, um, internet blog uh, rebranded applied statistic to data wisdom. So uh, it's very much copycatting the, at the time, the wisdom definition in Wikipedia actually has changed. So I couldn't find it. Uh, right now, somebody edited it, so it's not the same. So I would say that data wisdom is the ability to combine domain mathematical and methodological knowledge with experience, understanding, common sense, insight, and good judgment in order to think critically about data and to make decisions based on data. So it's kind of covered the self side of interpreting, connecting with reality. So there are set tens of questions to help people to gain, I would call data wisdom ability, basically from teaching a PT level course in statistics, applied statistics in Berkeley for the seven years. So the topic of uh, today is really about spatial genomics data. Jennifer in her first talk, alluded to some genetic problem. So here she talked about protein-protein interactions. And what I bring in is we're going to end up with a network, but the information here is spatial. So it's kind of like co-occurrence or association by guilt. So when you know two genes are expressed and co-vary in certain regions of location, then you conjecture they probably interact because they seem to go things together. And what I'm looking at is really um, part of system biology and this Berkeley Drosophila genome project. So Drosophila actually share about 75% genes as human. So it's very cheap and a model organism to study a lot of gene-gene interaction, a lot more advanced than yeast, but still not as advanced as us. And we're looking at, in the first an hour and a half to three hours development to understand how the fruit fly embryo build different organs. So think about building a house. They want to build different rooms in the house. And each gene you think of as a worker. And the worker will collaborate with other workers depending on what they are building. So that's kind of a good metaphor. And from traditional uh, biology, we know that they compartmentize the building process, like these different regions, like different rooms in a house. And we use this fit map and with 7,000 genes with one terabyte of data in the project, try to reconstruct this kind of schematic map as a first validation. I hope we'll do better than uh, the old technology. And this is a proof of concept to show that with something called laser ablation, a woman scientist from Germany, she's still, she's actually did this for very young, Christine Newson Bernhardt, got Nobel Prize in 1995 for her work in the 70s to figure out this gap gene network. This gap gene network is really like setting up the Y coordinate system, like the, the division on the stripes for the uh, Drosophila uh, embryo. And lower there is the human embryo. You can see that you know, we're not that different from a fruit fly in the early stage. We segment our body into different parts. And if you look at the net gene, so this OVO is really like embryo. And you see these two orange color HP, that means hunchback. So if you knock out that gene, the embryo will become like a hunchback. And tailless means you knock out that gene, it won't have a tail. So it's very uh, descriptive. 
and GI means become giant big. So you see two blues and two orange. It means that at the anterior part of the, the embryo, giant interact with HB and KR, and in the posterior will interact with another bunch of genes. So basically this worker, giant, will work with different teams to do different things. So this is already known. We're going to use this to validate what we find. And this is kind of our overview. Oh, can I, how do I go back here? Of our framework. So we have a team of statisticians from my group, a team of biologists from IBL, a team of computer science from Tsinghua University. And the whole uh, framework is like we do the statistical machine learning part, and we go to wet lab to do NOCA experiment, and then the Tsinghua team will build up uh, open source software on Spark and Fiji, which is biomedical open source, to uh, for other people use similar data, can use our um, development to, to do their science. So it's a whole, basically three subject coming together. And right now, we are using actually uh, something sparse coding or non matrix matrix factorization. Later, we want to do, probably deal with small hypothesis testing and data perturbation. And on the CI side, they have to deal with data metadata management, data-driven automation, and open source. So we kind of bring it together through this we call CISPA uh, framework. And so while I was brought down to the project, then I was working on computational neuroscience. Too bad Fifi Lab. I was going to thank her that we actually used uh, ImageNet she spoke about. And we were writing a paper called Artificial Neurons Meet Real Neurons. So what we do is that we use uh, deep learning and take the last layer out with the artificial neuron, and we have a single neuron for V4 macaque. So we put it together with the last layer trained use real physiology data, but the first few layers use uh, artificial neurons. And we do really uh, state-of-the-art prediction. And so at the time, I was working on, still working on computer neuroscience. When we have images, one thing come to mind is, can we do this decomposition, which happened very nicely with uh, computational neuroscience? You have these edge detectors. Indeed, we can do that. We later moved to uh, non-negative -matri non matrix factorization instead of uh, exactly sparse coding. So we just um, put our images into, there's tons of work, which I didn't speak about. 80% work is about processing, so we can do that. It's a huge amount of work. Registration, denoising, all kind of things before we can put that into the same grade and like a matrix. Somebody talked about a bulldozer and become a matrix, and that was that did. Lots of work. So each image become a vector, and we didn't code the spatial correlate, uh, relationship. So just you can scramble the rows, it's fine. And then we did a non-negative matrix factorization using a package called SPAN by former postdoc, um, Julian Morrell. And I don't have time to give the details, and we developed some stability-driven criteria to decide how many components, and that's what we got. So those are the 21 we call principal patterns. And when we showed it to biologists, they really loved it. They see meaningful patterns. You see the stripes? It's almost like vertical and horizontal according the system. And you have anterior and posterior about the brain and the guts. And then you can lay it out. Oh, this is not projecting very, right, very well. So the colors are a little messed up. Uh, so you can see that we can map qualitatively to this feed map, which is now precise, to say that the red is like about the gut, and there's fall gut, there's about skin, there's about the stripes, and they are biological meaningful. So that's just visual inspection. But then you have to go further than that to validate why this decomposition is useful. And what we did is also to see that uses to characterize all the genes. So we did another post-processing using lasso to make things even more sparse and say that, so different genes, each pattern you can think of as a different room in this building up of different rooms, okay? So I have 21 rooms, and we look at which genes have substantial expression in that room, and we said that gene is working in that. And then you look at all the genes, here I plot is like if two rooms are close, and I plot how many genes they share. Those are the proportion on the vertical axis. So you would think that the two rooms are very close, the principal patterns are very close, they should share a lot of workers because it's more efficient. But then you see the whole pattern kind of going back. So that means there are rooms quite far apart, one is the anterior, one is the posterior, they share a lot of genes too. 
and you look at them, it turns out that they are the uh, fall gut and hind gut crosstalk because they are the part of the digestive system. They share the same tissue. So of course, they share similar genes. So it's not just distance, but also the functionality of the rooms also share the same workers, right? You have a kitchen, you have a bathroom, you probably, they share a lot of same plumbers. Similar idea here. Uh, so that's, it's just something to validate that what we get is meaningful. And then we went back to that gap gene network. Uh, oh, that cross is also off. So that should be a little high up between the, the knee and giant in the back. So that's got off too from the reprojection. So for the 12 uh, links in this gap gene network, we were able to reproduce 11. So that was not bad. And the other one, we got the opposite sign. We think it's because when we had the embryos manually labeled to this particular early stage, four to six, there's mismatch because it's not precise. So things not simultaneously happening, and therefore they look over at, but in reality, if you have simultaneous measurement, they actually don't interact. We think that's the reason. But Church's group from uh, Harvard last year had a paper saying that they can actually simultaneously measure a thousand different gene expressions. And if that become reality, that's really a good uh, application of what we develop here. We now have mismatch over time because it's humanly visually inspecting, say, at the kind of early stage. So the timestamp is very coarse here. And then the next is like, this is suggestive. We see links. And one thing I didn't point out, you couldn't see in that network for that particular room, that's we think how they interact. There's something called CG, I don't think you can see. CG means computational gene. That means they know their genes for you know, looking at the binding and the product, but they don't know what these genes do. And some of these CG genes in our data show very strong connection to this gap gene network. And I've been told it's a huge, you find a new member of the gap gene network, because gap gene is supposed to, people think it's complete. And it's a, such a famous gene network. So that's what we did. So we took these genes, four CG genes, and we took three gap gene network and find the strand links. So the design criteria at this stage was qualitative, was that we want to find new members of the gap gene because it's famous. We also want to discover things people haven't seen before. So it's both confirm things we know or close to something we know and new um, discoveries. And then last year, actually almost more than a year ago, we started doing, or the lab started doing NLK experiments. And that took a long time. Um, so we just finished the first paper without a lab uh, result because I've been waiting for the lab result to come up, but we decided that we just cannot wait anymore. We have to publish the more uh, predictive and the decomposition part. So the technique, why it took so long was because the lab, uh, through Seneca's lab, uh, for the first time used CRISPR, case nine um, technology to do the knockout. So K CRISPR case nine is attributed to three people Jennifer Duna, actually in Berkeley, Emil Chapentier, I think now in Germany, and Feng Zhao in Broad Institute, and Berkeley and MIT in a patent fight uh, about who owns the CRISPR a case nine patent. And somebody said, this will fight forever, and therefore everybody can still use it. So uh, some people don't want them to resolve. So it's basically a molecular scissor, which borrowed from the bacterial defense system against viral invasion. To, it's like a scissor. You can cut very precisely, relatively easily, where you want to cut. But actually, there are different versions of it, as I learned. So when you say use CRISPR, depends on which base pair you choose, actually, you don't get the same result. Which, so now cow is not really single. Uh, I'm not worried about that right now. And here are some results. So uh, for the first line, they are the, uh, so what being knocked out was CG13894. And the, the first row, are the wild type normal embryos. And then the lower panel has the mutant images. And for the middle one, we're looking more closely, the Fushi Terrazu, definitely we got something because you knock out that gene later, not at this stage, the embryo actually die. So definitely it's important. But we're not too happy because that's not we, pre we want something more precise and quantitative than it's important. So we think our prediction is that we'll actually um, 
change the gap from our data, it seems like it's interact with a gap gene, and we think the spacing will change. But that turned out to be very difficult to see because there's variability within um, different embryos, and how do you measure the stripes? So we're in the deep investigation of how to make sense of this randomized knockout experiments, and that has been going on for a month. And we have a lot of slides of embryos uh, which haven't been looked at. So it's become very, very labor intensive. And um, we might have to look at higher precision data. So you can see that humanly it might be something, but definitely we know that gene kills the fly, but that's not the most impressive quantitative prediction. Um, so we hope to get more. So that's where we are. And of course, we try to uh, provide a platform for other type of genome data. And for this uh, RNA-seq data, you don't have spatial information, but you have different conditions, kind of a surrogate for space. And we tried it very uh, briefly on mod inco data, which the lab also produced. We do see similar reasonable uh, principal patterns, right? but we haven't invested enough. And as I said, this uh, cloud-based infrastructure of system biology analytics based on Spark and Fiji hopefully can be used by other labs to do their own decomposition. I really see this sparse coding and negative matrix composition as a way kind of modern uh, PCA when you have high dimensionality with enough constraints. It's decomposition, and it's a linear fashion, and uh, has been empirically proved useful in space sparse coding, computer neuroscience, with physiology support. So I think uh, that would, uh, would be useful for other labs as well. And here's like what we hope. We hope to develop new statistical machine learning methods, but very validated by this particular uh, scientific investigation. I also have computer science development and uh, understand gene gene interactions. And eventually, we hope to provide insight also suggestion for human genetics, because uh, we share 70% of the genes. And this is really a data science done by multidisciplinary and international team. And that's a shameless plug for my uh, last year's presidential address, which traced history of data science back to 1890 uh, census. That's where I think computer science, the first tabulation machine called Harrowith, was developed because we have to do census in 10 years. Uh, here's the team, and I was saying that we have a fused team brain that you basically need the interpersonal and leadership skills so we can talk. Um, really tap into each other's brain with the knowledge we need to solve this problem. And my student, Sichi Wu, has been really the great um, team member and do a lot of the work on that. And my uh, co-lead, Irvin Fries, and in Sue Seneca's lab. And actually, uh, my postdoc, Antonio Joseph, now is warm my lab. Uh, so you can see the training on genomics is useful, probably for industry as well, and the team at um, and the Yao's Institute in Qinghua, led by Wei and the sponsored agencies. Thank you. Thank you so much.